My name is Sylvia Kim. I'm 37 years old, um, and I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. I came to the United States about six years ago when I was in my, I guess, in my early 30s. Um, I came because I married a Korean American, um, and I think he had enough of the Canadian winters. So after five patient years, he finally convinced me um, that it was time to uproot and come to SoCal. So I was born and raised in Toronto, which is an urban city on the east side of Canada. Um, and the city that I grew up in specifically was called Scarborough. Mm. Um, so it was actually nicknamed Scarlum. It's like where all the thieves and the rapists go. And so there were like no Koreans there. Um, any Korean that could would not live in Scarborough. Um, but my father, Danny Seo, um, loved to be very frugal and thought that he could have his little mansion or his little castle in Scarborough. Um, so we literally lived there until my parents retired a few years ago. Um, so growing up in Scarborough, which is very different than what people view of, uh, as Toronto, it's a brown-black neighborhood. Um, I was the only Korean um, all the way up to eighth grade. Um, and in general, there were not a lot of Asians there. Um, and so I kind of grew up really like speaking Jamaican Patois, <laughs> learning some Urdu. Um, I always remember in kindergarten um, on the first day of school, um, this girl, Stacy Hall, was like, girl, there ain't no such thing as Korea. And I was like, yes, there is. Um, and I remember, you know, asking my mom to like cut out a map of Korea. And I brought it around with me in my back pocket <laughs> just to almost like reassure myself that Korea was really in existence. Um, every Halloween, we would wear our hanboks for our costumes because <laughs> nobody had ever seen, um, you know, a hanbok before. And, you know, I kind of grew up in my own little worldview that, you know, Korean, like we were literally the only Koreans in my universe. Um, and so that was what it was like. Uh, my parents had a convenience store. Um, and so if you've heard of a little show called Kim's Convenience, um, which is actually based uh, on a Korean Canadian family in Toronto, um, a lot of that, um, I share a lot of uh, lived experience with that storyline. Um, my father's first convenience store was actually just down the street from Kim's Convenience. Growing up in Scarborough was really growing up in such a diverse, beautiful society. I have to honestly say that in my childhood, perhaps there were instances of racism, but because I was also learning so much about the diversity around me, it, I never felt targeted. Um, and you know, there really was not a lot of white people in my class. There was, I think, one French Canadian and one regular Canadian. Um, and really the, work, the rest, we were like the United Colors of Benetton. Um, and so I really, I think, didn't get a better understanding of um, the dimension of race and its role in society until I was much older. Um, probably not until uh, I was in high school and college. Um, but growing up, you know, it was really such a, when I think back, it was such a beautiful kind of vision, I think, of a tolerant, diverse society. That's something that I really want for my children and have pursued um, throughout my career, um, pursuing racial justice. Um, but um, I think in the United States, it's a very different context. Um, and what I experienced in my childhood, I think, was a very special, um, perhaps even almost nostalgic um, piece of uh, really a childhood that maybe is not real, real reality. I then went on, of course, to discover that Canada was not um, the utopia I thought it had always been, um, you know, doing a lot of work in Aboriginal rights, um, where uh, Native Canadians really live in third world conditions, um, a lot of racial profiling issues, um, even in my beloved Toronto. Um, and then, of course, uh, moving to the United States um, in the year of Ferguson and kind of experiencing the, the whole explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement. I think Canada and the U.S. are extremely different on many, many levels. And um, I think that one of the differences is that Canada essentially, when you look at the history of the country and how it came to independence, um, that's really built into the fabric of the identity of Canadians. So, you know, we achieved independence peacefully. Some may say we were cowardly or weak or, you know, didn't rebel against the British, um, but really we're a commonwealth country. And so I just find that Canadians have a more peaceful, tolerant approach um, just in every fabric of their society. Of course, it's not a perfect society. Yes, it has universal health care. It has its issues. Um, I have to sadly say that it had a lot of human rights issues when it came to the Aboriginal communities. Um, but I think America has this kind of very rebellious identity. Um, and I think fundamentally um, people are fighters and, you know, have this notion of the Second Amendment, like, don't you dare get on my property because I'm going to shoot you. Uh, it's just a very different 
identity, I think. And so I don't know if that comes from the history of the countries. I mean, I think there's some correlation there. Um, but I also think that um, that history, um, how it plays out in present day, is that the kind of racist intolerance and discrimination that is experienced in America is much more violent and aggressive and in your face um, than it is in Canada. They have its pros and cons. Um, when I was kind of advocating for racial justice in Toronto, a lot of times we say that racism is cloaked by multiculturalism. So just because you have, you know, a department of multiculturalism or, you know, live in Kumbaya with, you know, different cultures and ethnic groups, it doesn't mean that all is well under, you know, under that, sh that sheen or that exterior. Um, but I think in the U.S. it's much more um, in your face. And I think that level of aggression was a bit shocking to me for sure. I think that uh, the Canadian identity in me is always going to be kind of the, one of the more dominant identities. Um, and I think that uh, perhaps one of the benefits I have moving here um, in my adult age, really as, as a parent, um, is that I have such a different worldview um, than my peers and the colleagues around me. Um, I would say that America, you know, it has its American dream, it has um, passion and drive and ambition, and I really respect those um, qualities in people. People really strive for the best. Um, I think that my challenges with um, American identity and American society as a whole, and again, perhaps rooted in that kind of rebellious history and revolt and revolution, is that sometimes there's just a lack of critical thinking when it comes to the placement of the US in global world order. And I think I would say that's one of the biggest differences. When you grow up in a country like Canada, and I also have colleagues in the UK or Australia or many of the European countries, you understand that there is a global world order and you're kind of this middle power and you have a sense of how countries need to interact on an international scale. Um, I think Americans are just, you know, it's all about America. <laughs> um, it is a very um, superpower perspective. Um, and I think unless you step out of that and really experience life in another country, it's hard to kind of see that um, the worldview of Americans is very insular. By trade, I am a lawyer, um, but I have actually not practiced law for over eight years. Um, right now, I am the Chief Innovation Officer at Asian Pacific Community Fund, and my main role is to incubate the first national Asian American Community Foundation. Um, so it's a very new role for me, kind of being in this philanthropic space. Um, and also a new role with a really funky title. Um, I can share a whole story about it. Um, so I. Uh, you know, didn't always want to be a lawyer. I, as I mentioned, grew up in French immersion. I went on to study against my parents' woes um, in French literature in my college years. <laughs> Again, the only Korean for miles around um, and had a vision of being this amazing French professor sipping wine in the south of France. Um, but then uh, George Bush uh, preemptively attacked Iraq. And that was kind of my political awakening. And I kind of went to this liberal arts college. Um, there were a ton of protests going around globally um, because really uh, what the American government had done was actually disrupt international laws and norms. Um, and so I went on my first protest um, in my second year of college, um, met the poli sci kids, ended up taking my LSAT. And I actually got in a year early. So I didn't even finish my undergraduate degree and went into law school. Um, I was one of the youngest uh, kids in law school, which I would not recommend. <laughs> um, and I think I went in really bright eyed, super idealistic. Um, I would say that every year of law school, I founded some kind of human rights initiative. Um, and so I was really passionate about international human rights um, and wanted to study international human rights. But I think I became disillusioned in one of my various uh, study abroad programs because international law is really governed by political will. Um, and so it doesn't matter how beautiful or aspirational the universal norms are, people are not going to enforce it. What's the point? Um, so I came back, ended up switching my major to criminal law, was a zealous criminal lawyer, starting first as a public defender, then as a criminal defense attorney, and then um, as a prosecutor. Um, and then uh, there was the 2008 economic downturn, um, decided to go backpacking. One of the organizations I had um, volunteered for, offered me a nonprofit position in policy and research and access to justice work. Um, I found that to be really fascinating and then I just haven't been back since. So I, I stayed in nonprofit for over 10 years now. 
um, usually in a kind of somewhat legal policy advocacy role. Um, and really my current role um, as a, you know, part of a community foundation, this is really my first time um, kind of going into the philanthropic industry. <laughs> Um, so in terms of my family history, um, I have to say that I'm pretty ashamed that I didn't really know anything until my 20s. Um, so as I had mentioned, I grew up in Scarborough, extremely diverse. Um, my understanding of Koreans was what kind of kage do you have at what intersection <laughs> and what church do you go to? And that was pretty much it. Um, you know, so we were at like, you know, the Scarborough intersections, which means that, you know, you're in the not safe area of town. Um, and then we went to a very large church called Toronto Korean Presbyterian Church. And even though I knew my grandfather had been a pastor, I didn't really understand the history. The ironic thing was that I had already been doing advocacy in the Aboriginal communities with a specific focus on leadership development. Um, and one of the things that I was doing was really talking about identity, cultural identity and how um, that could really be the source of empowerment. Because what I saw on a lot of the native reserves were that kids were rejecting their native identity so violently that a lot of them were committing what was called chain suicides. So deciding to commit suicide together. And there was so much shame in their culture um, and their language, you know, that all of those things being taken away from them by essentially the church um, and the government. Um, so in my first year of law school, I remember we did these native identity conferences and we were bringing in all these mentors and kind of native leaders who had kind of made it and could inspire these young children or youth. Um, and so I remember we had brought in over 200 you know, native youth um, all to my church actually to really talk about native identity and reclaiming that identity. It's a very powerful experience, um, but I remember we did it again the next year and um, the keynote speaker turned to me at that time and was like, you know, Sylvia, I love what you're doing and, you know, we are so thankful to the Korean community and the Korean a Christian community that really has done so much mission work um, to build uh, bridges of reconciliation. But I'm just kind of curious, like, what about you and your Korean identity? And I have to say, like, until he asked me that explicitly, I don't think I ever stopped and realized that I wasn't really practicing what I was preaching. Um, so I remember feeling kind of like, oh my God, I know nothing about Korea. I'd backpacked in Europe, but I'd never been to Korea um, and had never like sat my parents down. They were always, you know, busy working. Um, so I remember that spring break, I went to Korea for the first time as an adult. That was the first time I found out that both sides of my family were originally from North Korea. And that just like blew my mind. I mean, from a human rights context, of course, I knew that there were issues there. Um, but I realized just how deep my ignorance was. Um, so I just started interviewing anyone and everyone I could. I tried to retrace the path of my grandfather. And I found that out that actually on my father's side, um, my grandfather became a Christian or his father had become a Christian through the Pyongyang revival. Um, through Canadian Presbyterian missionaries. And so that was why after the Korean War um, and they decided to immigrate, they decided to come to Canada. And my grandfather actually founded, co-founded the Toronto Korean Presbyterian Church, which was one of the oldest uh, Korean Presbyterian or first Korean Presbyterian churches in Canada. Um, and there is just this really rich history. Um, and, you know, I heard stories, incredible stories of the war and what that was like. Um, my dad was born in 1950. And my mom was born in 1953, so I'll never forget the years of the of the Korean War. Um, and I think what that did to me, um, because after I found that out, I actually ended up co-founding a human rights organization uh, for North Korean refugees called Hun Voice. Um, and I always say, like, my life has never been the same. And I think what it really did for me was unlock this really deep um, passion and really a power in my identity that I had not unlocked before um, and really gave a lot of purpose to my life. Um, and I would say that I've been really doing North Korean human rights advocacy um, on and off uh, since then, since my trip to Korea. So one of the things that I absolutely want to pass on to my children and have already been doing so in maybe in a forced way is that reclaiming of their Korean identity. And so because for me it came so late in life, um, I mean, my son's probably already sick of it. I'm like, did you know that you're a great grandfather? <laughs> um, and so he's probably like rolling his eyes. But, um, you know, for me, it's so important um, that we document where we come from. And, you know, one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be a part of this legacy project, I think the 
um, collection of our stories will really unlock the power for the next generation. And that's something that I want my children to have and to know just how powerful their lineage is, how resilient our grandparents and great grandparents are and how there's so much power in that. It doesn't matter what the reality is for Korean Americans in the US, where we come from is so critically important and I think really unlocks really um, true uh, sources of peace um, and also confidence and power um, in who we are and knowing that we stand on the shoulders of all of our parents and our grandparents. Um, so, you know, if anything that I could pass on to my children, it would be to be so proud of where they come from. Um, and, you know, it's not to say, you know, stay in your insular Korean community. It's about just knowing that power. Um, because one of the things that concerns me sometimes is that the Korean community, we're so busy trying to either fit in or not being aware enough of um, just the historical power um, that sometimes I think we get caught up in that reality. Oh, we're not being represented enough. There's not enough of us. And of course, those are all very true, but we come from a lineage of extremely powerful, extremely resilient people. And I think that's something that I want to instill in my children and never have them ever feel ashamed um, that they're Korean. Um, so that's you know one thing for sure that I would want to instill in them. I think a second thing that I definitely want to instill in them, which is obviously harder, is to um, really uh, just live their dream. <laughs> and I think that that is something that, you know, is obviously very subjective. Um, and I think that there's just not enough freedom, I feel like, in the Korean community as well. And even for myself to really feel empowered that you're really living your dream and really achieving something in a way that you were originally designed to do. Um, so I think if I could somehow instill in my kids and be able to observe as their parent, you know what, God had a special plan for them. They're designed in a very specific way. Um, and if I can somehow, um, you know, uh, uh, encourage them to kind of live in their natural design, I think that that's uh, kind of a different approach that I really want to take with them. I would say that um, the Korean Canadian community is obviously behind because we don't have, we don't have as long an immigration history as Korean Americans. Um, but there was so much mobilizing going on even as I was leaving. Um, and I'm proud to say that, you know, even as I was in law school, I was one of six Koreans at my law school. We were starting to form the Korean Canadian Lawyers Association, the Korean Canadian Lawyers Students Association. I think there's some real institutions that have gone on to thrive after I left Canada. There's a Korean Canadian Scholarship Foundation that really gives backs to students across the country. And um, there's a lot of actually amazing Korean Canadians that live in the States, like Sandra Oh. Um, Sandra Oh, Sandra O's uncle had a video store. So actually when she was starting out in her career, she actually I think went to theater school in Canada as well. My dad was part of a network of Korean distributors, video distributors, who promised to distribute her like indie B-title film because they were just so proud that she was Korean. Um, and it's incredible now how far she's come, but um, you know, really uh, there was definitely a thriving Korean Canadian community, many Korean Canadian churches as well. I would say that one of the things that I found most challenging and that I do regret about um, is just not being there more for my kids when they were younger. And I think this is a common struggle for working moms. Um, and to be honest, like I just didn't have a lot of role models. Um, you know, when I, uh, you know, my mom obviously did an incredible job. Um, she had a master's in psychology and then ended up at Akage. Um, she got spat on because she couldn't speak English. And so she just kind of like devoted herself to my brother and I. Um, and was like the original, I call her the dragon mom. She wasn't just a tiger mom, she was a dragon mom. Um, and so, you know, I love her for that, but I also knew that I didn't want to necessarily be that. And she had given up so much and sacrificed so much. Um, as I started in my legal career, a lot of women were choosing really essentially their careers and having these full-time nannies. Um, and I just didn't find a lot of peers that were really trying to be fully mom and also fully professional. So one of my biggest regrets um, is actually um, before my daughter was even one and my son at the time was I think two and a half, almost three, I actually left them to pursue my master's in law um, at Oxford in England. And it was an incredible experience. You know, I'm so thankful that I had such a supportive um, husband and also family that were able to step in. But I have to say that guilt has always like gnawed at me and um, that guilt really came to fruition I would say when my son was in first grade um, and you know I had been you know winning different awards and you know doing so much incredible work in civil rights and kind of living my dream and contributing to a lot of the North Korean policy work 
Um, and I had been going to back-to-back -back conferences in like DC and speaking. And you know, it was great. My, my career was you know, taking off, I felt like, and especially in the United States, um, which was really exciting. And one day between my DC trips, my son looked at me and he was like, mommy, do you love your work more than you love me? And I remember I was like so heartbroken and um, you know, I would say like that just struck me, like struck and I just, I was speechless. I like bawled my face off. Um, I, I'm sad to say that was only in like 2017. So it's not like it's been, you know, a number of years. Um, but I think that really showed me like, no, like I'm a mom, like that is my central identity. It doesn't matter what awards you're winning or accolades, like nobody cares. At the end of the day, for your kids, you have to be there and fully present. Um, so um, I really regret that my son had to say that to me. Um, but at the same time, I'm so thankful that he did. And I'm proud to say that in 2018, that was the first time I really joke around like hashtag mom goals. Like that was the first time I really decided like I need to be there at everything, like every school event, every parent teacher event. I was known as like the hot mess mom, always like, like screaming at my kids, like right in the nick of time, like getting a truancy letter when my son was kindergarten um, and really just making sure that that was the priority of my life. Um, and that was also, to be honest, one of the reasons why I also left my last job and moved into a position that's much more flexible um, and allows me to fully be a mom, pick up my kids when I need to pick up my kids um, and just make sure that they know that they're the number one priority in my life. My name is Sylvia Kim, and this is my Korean-Canadian-American story. Mm -hmm.